First of all, I should say, you know, it's so great to be here because uh, I've been invited by uh, very dear friends of mine, and I'm sorry that I had to rush it because I had my own obligations at the university where I teach. And so I had to, I, I'm ba barely land, well, I just landed now. Uh, so sorry for the inconveniences, but uh, very happy to be here and to share uh, uh, some of this uh, thinking in the context, of course, of the very specific issues already that Geraldine framed to be, uh, for the beginning of this gathering. So it's uh, great to see uh, some, some uh, dear friends. Uh, I'll dive into the material because I decided to kind of, uh, you know, it's always very hard to, to edit, but I wanted to really move across the scales that have been the interest of, of my practice in the, in the last uh, 12, 15 years. Uh, in the context, again, of, of, of this uh, border territory that we all occupy, regardless of the specificity at times, you know, whether San Diego, Tijuana, or uh, here and beyond. So moving from the global border to the border neighborhood, that has been, in the last years, the, the, the pretty much uh, the inspiration for, for the practice and the rethinking, ultimately, um, of um, the rethinking of my practice, I should say that. I mean, much of my work has not necessarily been uh, obsessed with buildings, uh, but in fact with the possibility of reconfiguring uh, socioeconomic relations and political constructs in order to prepare the ground uh, uh, for the architectures at least that I aspire uh, uh, to enact. But particularly is that what I wanted to share with you, the process of transformation of my practice in the last years, uh, uh, engaging this very specific uh, locality of the border. Uh, so moving from a concept that I began to articulate a few years ago, the political equator, emerging very much uh, out of an intu intuitional moment of extending a line that connected San Diego, Tijuana, across the world atlas to see what would occur. And in fact, I was extremely surprised that San Diego, Tijuana is in the same corridor uh, uh, of conflict, as I would argue, connecting itself with Ceuta and Melilla, which is the main funnel of migration from North Africa into Europe, the Israeli-Palestinian border, and so on, and ending on the other side. And I took the freedom to even suggest that the explosion of urbanization in China was also out of urbanities of labor and surveillance. So this political equator uh, coinciding uh, with uh, the reconfiguration of the world's cartographies by, uh, after 9-11, uh, by the Pentagon's new map dividing the world between what they call now the non-integrating gap, which refers to the dysfunctional families of the global south, seeking the strong economies, in fact, of the functioning core, as they refer to particularly the northern uh, hemispheres, uh, the strong economies of Europe and the United States. Uh, so in one direction, we have the unprecedented flow of people seeking these strong economies, and on the opposite direction, the decentralization of uh, centers of production, seeking, in fact, out of the politics of outsourcing uh, the cheap labor markets of the non-integrating gap. And for me, it was a very clear kind of uh, 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 a set of relations that at a global scale not only connected the locality where I live and uh, work, but really uh, defining uh, the implications of understanding the specificity of this locality against uh, uh, the world or global uh, scale. So obviously, this became a very strong, thank you, I should have asked for that earlier. Um, uh, obviously, this became a very interesting diagram uh, to begin reconsidering the relationship of architecture and the political, uh, of architecture in the, pre in the, in the kind of um, uh, imperative, I guess, of the uh, realigning of individuals and collectives and institutions, the ethical imperative across those scales. So the political equator, again, uh, uh, allowing or enabling these marginal communities that have been engaging in the last years to become laboratories of governance and of rethinking these uh, relations. Well, what's interesting is that recently I juxtaposed over the non-integrating gap, the, uh, again, uh, this um, political equator, the climatic equator, uh, coinciding with probably the words of somebody like Book Minister Fuller already decades ago when he was reminding us that any conversation uh, in rethinking not only our practices but enabling a very different conception of the global would have to begin by uh, considering the relationship across geopolitical boundaries, marginal communities, and natural resources. And in fact, this is, in a sense, a very powerful diagram to reorganize much of our protocols in terms of our institutions. 
Of course, when we zoom into the specificity of the locality where I've been working again and practicing the last years, uh, devoting my practice particularly to two neighborhoods that are divided by the border on to the north San Isidro, and I put it white uh, kind of, uh, uh, as a kind of off-the-radar type of environment, San Isidro, which is next to the checkpoint, and to the south, uh, the Laureles Canyon, which is home to 85,000 people. It's a slum that crashes against the wall. The new, uh, newly, uh, uh, the new jurisdiction of Homeland Security, and in between them, the estuary, the Tijuana River estuary. So these two marginal neighborhoods becoming the site, again, of intervention uh, and of exp exploration in the last years. Uh, uh, recently, I had the opportunity to begin curating a series of conversations that I ended up calling the Political Equator Meetings, beginning in 2006. I've been interested, in fact, in that aspect of architects becoming curators, sort of cultural pimps of types of cross-institutional relations in, in a new debate, let's say, grounded in these conditions. And the linkage of these two neighborhoods became the framework for this last event last June. I wanted to begin with this uh, uh, act, uh, this gesture. We proposed to Homeland Security well, not only, again, there is no time here to elaborate on so many of these details, but the political equator sought to decentralize ourselves from the university to, in fact, inhabit, inhabit almost in an embodied way the actual uh, uh, geographies of conflict, to be there, to be sur surrounded by the issues, and to really uh, recontextualize the conversation. So uh, I brought uh, the 300 or so people who came to this last conference uh, to uh, a tent that we uh, uh, installed right next to the wall with the permission of Homeland Security within Homeland Security's jurisdiction and propose an alternative passage of the border, the crossing of the border through a drain that Homeland Security has re recently built uh, at the very collision between the slum, uh, basically the Aureles Canyon, and the estuary, between the informal settlement and this incredible um, ecological uh, preserved uh, zone that is overlaid with militarization. And it is here, in the midst of the construction of the new wall, which Homeland Security has begun to construct uh, in order to con uh, build a co an uninterrupted highway for Homeland Security Border Patrol cars, damming every canyon that crosses the border tangentially. It is here we decided to, in fact, settle uh, or set the conversation between the environmental zone and this informal settlement. As Homeland Security has begun to dam these canyons, uh, they have begun to accelerate, in so doing, the flow of sediment and pollution from the slum into the estuary. Um, I will tell you later how, of course, many of these slums in Tijuana obviously build themselves with the waste of San Diego, but now the waste is coming back to San Diego, again, after Homeland Security has been building this new wall. This trash is flowing with the water, with, this, with the pollution, with the sewer uh, into the estuary. So this is the, the, the context that framed this conversation of the political equator three, building visualizations uh, around these geographies, uh, convening, in fact, the stakeholders that are uh, in the institutions that are part of the problem, Homeland Security, community activists, uh, uh, local uh, agencies, artists, scholars. Uh, I've been interested very much on a, on a notion by Chantal Mouffe uh, that really uh, suggests that uh, the redefinition of our ideas of public uh, space, that public space is really a battleground uh, where uh, the hegemony of economic and political power, institutional power, is exposed, is visualized, and where the different stakeholders engage into a debate. In other words, it is an intervention in the debate itself that has been of interest in the last years. Uh, so as this uh, conversation takes place, we also cross the border and we got permission again, and I say this because it was essential as a sort of Trojan horse to really make these institutions accomplices. And we got a permission uh, in my collaboration with Oscar Romo, who is an activist working in this uh, slum and in, in the Tijuana River estuary as an environmentalist, we got a permission to cross a drain, the newly built drain that Homeland Security just uh, recently finished, and we got permission to transform it into a 24-hour official point of, uh, uh, port of entry from the United States into Mexico. So here's where the 200 and so uh, people, uh, we are crossing the border with our passports in hand, 
and uh, Mexican immigration is waiting for us on the other side of the drain, on the south side of the drain, uh, to in fact stamp our passports because this was an official crossing. But next to the officer, we find the sewer and all of the pollution again that is flowing from the slum into the estuary. Uh, at the end, we cross into the slum where Sergio Fajardo, the former mayor of Medellin, delivered a, a, a presentation in the context of many of the communities and activists working in that slum. So it is this uh, possibility, again, of radicalizing the local, exposing the very political and socioeconomic conditions that continue to be hidden and that continue to be invisible to the institutions, what has been of interest how to reveal, again, that specificity as a point of departure, the material itself for the designer. I mean, I think that whenever I talk about this, I always go back to the words of, I hate to say it, but Bernard Schumi in the 80s, when he was reminding us that while architects are obsessed with the conditions of design, we in fact should be in designing the conditions within which things could occur. In other words, we could begin curating uh, those conditions uh, that it would enable the kind of reorganization uh, ultimately of those systems across any imaginable register. So uh, the, the specificity of this uh, uh, political aspect of this region has been important as material. Um, and uh, following the diagram of the political equator, I recently also produced this other uh, cross-section, if I can call it that, a kind of geographic cross-section across the scales which uh, of course, obviously, while my work has been engaging the, the border itself as a line, whether metaphorically and beyond, in reality, I'm less interested on the metaphorical aspect and more on the operational set of procedures tangential to the line. Inland, 60 linear miles across San Diego and Tijuana. So I ended up calling this, in fact, this exercise 60 linear miles of transborder conflict. I decided to begin registering 30 miles deep into San Diego and 30 miles deep into Tijuana, a photographic cross-section uh, that would begin to document, if anything, panoramically, photographically, uh, places where within these two environments we begin to uh, witness the physicalization of global conflict, the materialization of conflict in the territory across a series of collisions, ecological collisions, uh, across the scales. So let's begin with 30 miles deep into San Diego and we might find the collision, the conflict between top-down forces of urbanization and the topography as many private developers had continued to in fact flatten the differential of the topography in order to install their very cheap recipes of suburbanization in the shape of master plan gated communities, which I saw as I was flying here. I mean, every city, and the reason I'm showing this is because this is not unique to San Diego. All these conflicts are reproduced infinitely in any city, I think, for that matter. Uh, the conflict between large infrastructure and the watershed as the large freeway ecology of Los, uh, from Los Angeles to Tijuana collides with many of the uh, <clears throat> you know, creeks and watershed systems that descend towards the coastal cities. The conflict between gated communities and everyday life, or as Rebecca Solnit called it, the apartheid of everyday life, the atomization and marginalization, the kind of archipelago of voids and of uh, fragments that uh, uh, separate communities, the conflict between military bases and environmental zones as the only places where the otherwise continuous urbanization from Los Angeles to Ensenada is interrupted is in fact where these military bases are placed, ironically respecting environmental zones. So this is a strange alliance between systems of control and uh, urbanization and further environmental zones is very, uh, is reproduced here. The conflict between formal and informal densities and economies as many neighborhoods in San Diego have begun to transform uh, 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 in the hands of immigrants. And when we arrive to the border, of course, the conflict between uh, two border cities that continue to ignore each other, that continue to separate each other, uh, the conflict as we cross the border, and I hope that uh, it was obvious already that the checkpoint between Tijuana and San Diego is exactly at the place where the Tijuana River intersects the border. So it's a very strange kind of uh, a, a sort of uh, overlay. So the conflict between the river and the border, when we enter now Tijuana, the conflict between informal settlements and natural ecologies, as also the slums in Tijuana are overlaid uh, over these watershed systems, the conflict between 
between factories and emergency housing, as many of the maquiladoras in Tijuana are adjacent to, in fact, these slums in order to borrow labor without investing anything in return. Uh, the conflict between density and sprawl, as many of the suburban recipes from Tijuana to Mexico City as are, in fact, projects of privatization by developers that are imitating a kind of Southern California DNA of urbanization, but in miniature. And when we arrive to the other side of the 60 linear miles of uh, transborder conflict, we find probably the mama, as I call it, of all conflicts, the conflict between the natural and the political at the very place where the border sinks into the Pacific Ocean. And obviously, this has been one of the most powerful images in the imagination of many artists uh, and architects working in this region because it's ultimately the emblem uh, emblematic manifestation, again, of a city is made of contradictions uh, and, and, um, and these sort of strange kind of images uh, of both difference and sameness. But as you can see, overlaid over this panorama, there is this cross-section of local conflicts. The argument, of course, out of this image was uh, not only responding to a commission, you know, when I was invited to participate in the architecture of Venice Biennale, to in fact install this cross-section and this border uh, just before uh, George Bush left office in September of 2008, the border between Tijuana and San Diego as a facade of the U.S. pavilion opening an exhibition that in fact was seeking uh, alternative practices in architecture that were in fact reorganizing themselves in the context of these conflicts. But it's obvious probably to many of you that what makes this cross-section incredibly uh, uh, dramatic is that at the book ends of this cross-section, we find probably one of the most compelling uh, uh, facts about this border and about probably every city in the world at this moment. Uh, the huge gap between wealth and poverty. No other place in the world you would find some of the wealthiest real estate as the one found in the edges of San Diego and Rancho Santa Fe where the Priscars live barely 40 minutes away from some of the poorest settlements in Latin America that dot the periphery of Tijuana. I think this proximity of wealth and poverty, of uh, circle centers of economic power, and uh, the kind of concentric circles of service communities that are used uh, as uh, migrant labor to construct these uh, aspirations of uh, multinational uh, capitalism is really at stake and has been again once more revealed. The kind of, how would I call it, the institutions of exclusion that have ultimately uh, defined the crisis of today replicate this everywhere. Of course, the counter uh, a, a set of procedures have been uh, so much of a, a seductive to my practice in Tijuana, San Diego, and to many of us seeking a practice of encroachment a kind of infiltration into the institutions themselves to seek a, a, a kind of transformation of those protocols. Uh, I cannot think of any other place also to begin uh, reimagining the very meaning of the political. Primarily at a time when, you know, so many times when, you know, friends of mine tell me, well, so what are you, an architect? Are you a social worker? Are you a politician? I think we've been banalizing the actual political uh, role of architecture because to be political does not mean to be a politician. Political, uh, the, the, to, to construct uh, 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 pol uh, the political implies, in fact, uh, to the strategize a course of action, uh, again, enabling the reorganization of much of uh, those protocols. So the rethinking of the political uh, begins to convey a very interesting set of notions uh, in my practice. I find the political to be, in fact, at the collision between the formal and the informal. It is at that place of uh, in critical interface. Or for that matter, what is the informal I have been asking in the last years? If not, in fact, uh, uh, the kind of act of uh, transgressing imposed political and economic recipes. In other words, the informal is not just an aesthetic category or a kind of uh, uh, a register in the context of uh, many uh, sort of position or positions in terms of uh, aesthetic systems is in fact a set of practices uh, that transgress and reorganize those imposed uh, political and economic recipes that enable probably other ways of constructing the city, other ways of constructing citizenship, because guess what? Citizenship in my mind is not just 
uh, having the papers that make you belong to a private club. Citizenship, in fact, is a creative act, and it must be uphold, upheld like that, a creative act that reorganizes institutional protocols. Uh, it is that a level of uh, contingency of the social uh, in the transformation of the city that has been in the hands of many immigrants in this country, and that at this very moment when there is a kind of backlash once more against immigration, not only here but in Europe, I think that we need to uh, uh, amplify the, 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 relevance, uh, uh, the relevant role that this uh, transformation play in reimagining the political. So my practice, as many of my friends know, has been grounded, uh, has been focused on the observation and translation of many of these transborder informal uh, urbanisms. Uh, and uh, for many of you, while familiar, this material, this is of course for the new students who I wanted to address, uh, has to do with a variety of flows, invisible flows across the border that transgress that formidable barrier the flow of people in one direction, the flow of waste in another have been in the last years definitely the registers, the kind of environments uh, that I've been uh, seeking uh, to understand. Um, speaking of the small bungalows, the, these post-war levy town bungalows that are, have been demolished uh, in the last years or given away as developers in San Diego have begun to build an inflated version, of course, of Levittown in the shape of McMansion communities. And these post-war bungalows are crossing the border or had been crossing the border. Uh, so uh, not, uh, these are houses, in fact, waiting to cross the border. And when uh, these houses cross the border, they are put on top of these moment frames, these steel frames, leaving the, again the first floor to become the second, uh, to infill it with more uses uh, or more house, not only people cross the border, but entire pieces, chunks from one city are moved to the other. Not, not only houses, uh, but also uh, rubber tires, which of course many of you have uh, known in the past as people use them for retaining walls. But look at what people have begun to do in the last years as they have figured out how to peel off the tire, uh, how to uh, loop it and interlock it into a more functional uh, system. Again, much of the theory, contemporary theory in urbanization, enabling the kind of uh, reconsideration of the unit into systems that are more operational, surfaces that are more decorative into maybe more functional uh, um, uh, systems is really brought alive again here out of a socioeconomic emergency. And uh, of course, I don't want to uh, glorify or romanticize poverty. I will get to that in a moment. I'm just trying to share with you how undeniably impressive this is uh, to really rethink also uh, the role of the relationship again of social contingency and material culture. Uh, garage doors from uh, the uh, Southern California that are uh, exported en masse to Tijuana uh, to construct entire housing in these environments uh, is really incredibly impressive again to, to witness. But again, it's not this brick collage and this sort of aesthetic uh, dimension of these uh, gestures which, which are nevertheless, and I shouldn't be afraid of saying they're incredibly beautiful because this is an architecture of parts. It's not really about the imposition of the object, but in fact about the threading of systems. Uh, but what I wanted to amplify is not again the informal as just uh, dealing with the glorification of this uh, architecture with our architects, but in fact, it's about enacting the operative dimension of informality, which really has to do with amplifying the informal as a praxis, as I mentioned earlier, as a set of practices, a set of procedures that need translation, that need, in fact, interpretation, that need to be abstracted in order to really redeploy them into the, into the formal city. That has been probably the, the most important aspiration of my practice in the last years, has been to translate this into devices, not only conceptually but operationally, to rethink the protocols of intervention into the contemporary city. Conflict as a creative tool. Uh, is a, a device, and in Tijuana, the conflict that has, I have been uh, uh, en enabling, or at least uh, witnessing, is a conflict between factories, labor, and housing. For the students, all what I'm trying to say is that before we begin a design problem, before we begin to decorate the program of the developer, we have to uh, really articulate what really is at stake here. I mean, what are the, what are the conflicts that we're en 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 you know, uh, uh, en enacting or enabling? Uh, so the conflict between factories, labor, and housing, 
many of the maquiladoras in Tijuana place themselves next to these shanty towns so that they in fact can again borrow cheap labor without giving anything in return. And so this has been an important aspect in, I wanted to mention to you is that uh, while uh, the architecture for humanities paradigm would uh, seek going to the slum directly to, buy, to, to build housing for the poor, I wanted to take a detour a critical detour to in fact go and try to really identify the basis of the problem. So this is imp an important issue in my practice in terms of these uh, uh, processes because we have been uh, working under the paradigm of problem solving, I think, which is ne necessary today, but nevertheless we've been trying to solve the problem in the short term. Habitat for Humanity builds housing, but this doesn't, they don't build communities. And I'm thinking for that matter, uh, that it was necessary to take a detour to understand a set of exchanges uh, in, in, in types of um, political frameworks that could enable uh, the political economy uh, of waste and of these communities. So while the factories borrow labor, uh, I was arguing in a very simple and naive way, uh, the factories could give something in return to these environments out of their own material systems uh, and assembly lines, connecting it uh, with, uh, again, the sweat equity. Uh, after all, these uh, shanty towns are factories of housing, people building their own housing uh, to enable a very different economy of development by triangulating with government subsidies and so on. In essence, the factory became the site of intervention. Uh, 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 here again, an, another rethinking of the role of the architect uh, that is, is trying to, uh, we are trying to uh, enable uh, a set of relations, like designing collaboration across these institutions that have remained divided. Uh, maquiladoras, government subsidies, community activism. Um, so we, be, we entered the factory, began to design and propose and, and build a series of systems uh, with their own materials, uh, again, uh, of production, such as this light uh, gauge uh, uh, steel frame that does not need welding, uh, but that can be assembled uh, uh, very easily and threaded into a space frame and into other kinds of connectors uh, to later be uh, retrofitted into the existing across a variety again of systems uh, that could then enable these uh, uh, scaffolds, very simple frameworks uh, to further stitch the systems that are recycled and so on. We're working in, in a community center in this shanty town uh, that uh, is uh, hybridizing some of these uh, uh, systems and, and programs. Uh, but the other one, which was really particular to the factory, which was this uh, Spanish maquiladora uh, that produces these pallet racks that are exported all over the world from Tijuana, is this uh, very simple uh, pallet rack system that uh, by retrofitting again and by just simply recombining the pieces, uh, they can begin to also serve as hinges that uh, stitch this waste in a variety of configurations. Uh, again, enabling ultimately the scaffold that could stitch this waste in more, uh, in more um, sort of tangible ways, the kind of visualization of these socioeconomic relations through uh, the, the spatialization of these uh, conditions of housing has been, of course, important to the practice, uh, resulting in these scaffold systems that, in my mind, again, open up uh, a, a topic, uh, and as, as I, it's obvious already that many of these yellow slides really are kind of mini manifestos of sorts. How does one seek the transparency between the formal and the social? To what degree the kind of social contingency the economic contingency uh, that is at play in these environments begins to, uh, uh, alt uh, begins to influence or have an impact in the spatialization uh, of these environments. So what are the conditions that construct community? I wanted to share a couple because while the work has been uh, very much engaged in the conceptual dimension of these uh, relations, I've been interested in, in, in collecting a series of, uh, again, uh, uh, frameworks to operate uh, and that could yield, again, a very specific architectures. Uh, so one question is this, what are the conditions that constructs community, uh, which really has been, again, very powerful to witness there? First, as I already showed, instead of looking at the informal as just an aesthetic category uh, or as precariousness, it is about here about the political economy of waste. This bricolage, this kind of assembly of systems is essential to the sustainability economically, and, and sociopolitically of these environments. There is an economy at play, in other words. 
in the relationship also of these people with these factories. Uh, another point that is important here is that out of the conflict between the jurisdictional and the natural emerges another way of constructing community. I decided to take the risk of uh, putting this in the, in, in the presentation, even though all, each of these uh, you know, uh, uh, concepts would uh, need time to open them up. But what I wanted to mention is that one of the most amazing lessons that I've uh, gotten in my relationship with these activists in this uh, shanty town of Los Laureles Canyon, this slum that I already mentioned before, is to begin noticing how the land title agencies begin to do the similar kind of situation by which our cities are constructed out of the abstraction and at times the stupidity of administrative boundaries. When in reality, people that place themselves in these hills really are trying to engage in some way or another the natural boundaries. Uh, in this collision, again, in this conflict between the jurisdictional and the natural emerges a very interesting uh, set of procedures. Uh, could we imagine, this is one of the concepts that has been uh, uh, most important to, to the work. Can we imagine the micro basins that are, that are uh, internal to these watershed systems and these canyons where these uh, 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 slums are placed? Can we imagine the micro basin as a way of constructing community? Instead of the abstraction of these imposed jurisdictional boundaries, can the actual uh, natural boundaries be a way of constructing a community but also a new political representation? The major work that has occurred in this uh, canyon in the last years in my collaboration uh, with this activist, Oscar Romo, has been to produce a public uh, trust that enables this community within this canyon to, have a, a, to form a watershed council, a kind of polit a new political representation at the scale of that uh, particular environment, and of course, to enable uh, a very different notion of public participation. So the specificity of ecological, social, and economic systems uh, uh, within this environment enables, again, the rethinking of property. Fundamental, I think, to, to our conversation today in the context of crisis, and for a more particular kind of concept that many people in Mexico know, the rethinking of the ajido. As tragically, we've gone from hyper-collective to hyper-private, nothing in between, I think this consideration that uh, the, the, the kinds of bottom-up energies embedded in these environments, uh, uh, supported by the right top-down resources, can begin to produce a very different idea uh, of participation and of political representation, but also making them co-developers of their own housing stock. So one of the, uh, the points of experimentation, I think this is maybe not working anymore, I hope, has been uh, to produce a, a model by which five families, I mean, the, these uh, slums in, in, in Tijuana are still, they have a lot of empty space in order to preserve the remaining empty, uh, open spaces of these uh, canyons, uh, we need to begin anticipating the densification of this environment. So one of the, uh, uh, again, uh, projects supported by the relationship to the maquiladoras, the production of this architecture of parts of these micro-infrastructural systems of retrofit has been how do we enable five families, in fact, to begin to co-develop uh, the additions and the kind of extensions of some of those existing environments, supported, of course, by uh, the reframing or reorganization of government subsidies and the intervention of the maquiladoras uh, to pro produce materials, and, of course, in this case, the environment is ripe for the architect to uh, come in. So the reorganization of socioeconomic relations becomes a foundation, I think, uh, for, the, for a very different idea of building here. Ultimately, we all know that what makes these environments incredibly powerful is that they are built out of the negotiation of time, boundaries, space and resources. I'm saying this because while uh, you know, some people might criticize many of us working on the informal sector or many noticing these types of uh, conditions, uh, they might suggest that because we are amplifying the creative intelligence of this community, we, uh, like Mike Davis suggested, we are inherently or silently suggesting that the government should withdraw from these environments. It is, in fact, the connection of government, of top-down resources, but acknowledging that creative intelligence to be a very uh, specific device to rethink the existing logics of economic uh, and social development. So yes, the aspect again, the kind of role 
of socioeconomic contingency. I know this is more technical for the students, but I was, I've been thinking lately, if parametrics did to the social and the political what it does to form, then we are talking. What I mean is that, in fact, uh, what has been off the radar has been the role of socioeconomic contingencies into space and its effect in producing new tectonics and spatial configurations still at odds, still off the radar in our debate. So while, again, all of this issue of ways going south is part of the research, uh, people going north primarily has been the site of intervention. The impact of immigrants in the transformation of the American neighborhood has begun a project in the last years more engaging uh, the visualization of hidden socioeconomic agendas in the American city. So in that sense, I've been interested in very uh, lyrical ways of uh, talking about these, uh, producing uh, images that become political instruments. When I show this image, for example, to our city council that works with the neighborhood I've been working in the last 12 years, it shifted the, the conversation fundamentally. I called it the, uh, the non-conforming Buddha. A, a, a cross-border land use story. I mean, again, while architectural schools has been so obsessed with a kind of palimpsest of this very complex diagramming, which, believe me, is essential because, if anything, we're trying to, uh, trying to manage complexity, the kind of f uh, f forces that ultimately con construct uh, the city, the very complex forces that construct the environment, uh, we have also just uh, perpetuated a conversation among ourselves. My interest has been how do we make something complex ex extremely digestible and accessible? So this this image it pertains to that uh, idea, I think, when I uh, rendered the north of uh, uh, basically San Diego, expressing the large scale of land use in San Diego that is exclusionary, that uh, separates uses into the south, the high pixelation uh, of uh, alternative uses in Tijuana, as I showed, again suggesting that this confetti, as I call it, of alternative uses has begun to infiltrate itself into the largeness uh, of these exclusionary land use uh, conditions. But when this confetti hits the ground, which is really what is at stake in our, many of our practices, begins to transform the one-dimensionality, the monocultural and mono-use condition of many of these parcels in many urban neighborhoods. I mean, this is, of course, obvious to many of you, but still the challenge is how these processes of alteration, uh, these uh, dynamics, again, uh, of retrofit can begin to trickle up to transform top-down policy. In, in, in economic recipes. Of course, I'm talking about the um, e informal economy that is plugged into a garage or to the illegal granny flat that is built next to, a, a, next to uh, an official house. How do we uh, then enable the translation of these uh, conditions? The stories are compelling, the illegal Buddha being one house, one post-war bungalow that saved itself and did not travel to Tijuana but his destiny was to be retrofitted by a group of uh, Buddhist monks into uh, a Buddhist temple. And of course, not, not, the, not only the transformation of this parcel through a kind of spatial set of typologies is important to witness uh, because it's all about the size of these parcels that needs to be challenged. But my interest has been in understanding, in fact, the formation of agency that these agencies grounded in these neighborhoods, non-profit organizations, groups like these, become in fact the informal city halls that begin to, uh, that have begun to, uh, to uh, develop a process by which these uh, uh, urbanizations of uh, retrofit, these informal socioeconomic contingencies can begin to bundle into something, can scale up, can begin to transform into a top-down policy in a very different idea of economic development. So the, the need for mediating agencies that can mediate between uh, government policies and what I would argue the necessity, the urgent uh, necessity of a civic imagination. So these mediating agencies and the interface between institutions and communities has been another environment of intervention in my practice, uh, uh, entering into uh, another aspect, I guess, having to do with the design, ultimately, uh, not only of collaboration across institutions, but with nonprofit organizations. It's also sad to say, while, I, while I'm amplifying the role of these very smart and progressive nonprofit organizations, many of them, they still suffer from a kind of 
uh, poverty of conceptual thinking in terms of how this uh, amazing social work can really be specialized. And this is here where we plug in uh, as architects, trying to enable the translation of this phenomena. It's too bad that this uh, projector is, uh, is very uh, dim, uh, but uh, the, uh, from the pixelation, as it hits the specificity of neighborhoods, as it enters into the narrativization of space to the Buddhist temple, as the collaboration with uh, non-profit organizations such as Casa Familiar in San Isidro has enabled in the last years the very careful design of micro-political systems and economies that then yield at the end of the kind of process uh, a specific uh, uh, housing configurations. I think it is that arduous process that takes so long, uh, as all of us know, uh, what has been of interest in my masochistic, you know, uh, uh, journey. So, how to open up other ideas of practice? Not, not all of us are interested in buildings, uh, but in fact, in the designing of political econo economic processes, in collaboration and engaging, in fact, this phenomena that can maybe yield at some point uh, their specialization. Uh, the need for a very different political language is important here. Uh, one of them, and I've shared, of course, many already from rethinking property uh, and so on, but rethinking density in, in my witnessing, again, of these environments has been essential. Of course, it's obvious that the construction of the city uh, is really following this type of paradigm. I mean, for everybody knows that density across any uh, uh, recipe, whether it's uh, uh, academic, governmental, and in terms of the forces of development, density is conceived in an incredibly abstracted, reductive way as an amount of objects per area. Uh, my experience in these neighborhoods in the last years has been, of course, uh, having to do with the need to challenge the reductive nature of this abstraction. Uh, that density in these environments is measured differently as an amount of social exchanges per area. And that, in fact, has enabled very different kind of modes of visualization, but also has en enabled the, the social organizational logics of this agency to begin to influence the construction of a new political uh, and economic frameworks. A new political language, as I was mentioning earlier, is necessary. Rethinking ownership. Primary, again, in our time when the city has been perpetuated out of the very single uh, homogeneous recipe of the developer's spreadsheet, the bottom line that has rendered already the, the terms from New York to San Diego extremely homogeneous. I've been arguing in a, in a kind of, if there were to be two provocative statements that I wanted to share with you, one was the micro basin as a way of constructing a neighborhood, and on the other would be the developer's economic pro forma as an instrument to construct community. In, in other words, it is a developer's spreadsheet, the site of intervention in our time. Can we, in fact, inject into the abstraction and the kind of inequity of this, uh, distribu uh, this uh, lack of distribution of resources, the value of informal economy as two women rent a three-bedroom apartment in San Isidro, transforming it into an illegal nursery and absorbed uh, in a stealth way by non -pro a non-profit organization into its social programming to rechannel and reorganize uh, funding? Can, in fact, sweat equity uh, and the value, ultimately, of collaboration be uh, uh, devices to completely rethink the distribution of resources in this spreadsheet. We are a, a, a enabling a series uh, of projects uh, that uh, would uh, hopefully make clear that that's a possibility. Other performance, other ways of constructing housing. Rethinking zoning in tandem with the rethinking of ownership as the conflict that has been probably most interesting in San Diego in the last years, even before the economic crisis, was the conflict between zoning and lending, realizing that in the most glamorous period of construction in San Diego, as in many other cities in the world, very few uh, social housing projects were built. In San Diego, at least very few affordable housing projects were built in these neighborhoods where I work. Realizing that for a private developer to make it profitable, to in fact build uh, in these uh, marginal communities, this developer, as we all know, would have to uh, uh, be competitive in terms of tax credits uh, and subsidies. But to be competitive, this developer would have to build a project that is at least 50 units in density. But guess what? 50 units of density is prohibited in many of these marginal neighborhoods, creating a catch-22 between ridiculous zoning 
in uh, exclusionary lending. So the possibility again uh, of entering uh, a challenge of rethinking zoning by in fact recuperating probably its main precept uh, decades ago, that zoning was never thought, I hope, as a kind of punitive tool that prevented socialization, but in fact as a generative tool that could organize activity and economy. And this is something that must be uh, forwarded in order to frame again and support the creative intelligence of these bottom-up dynamics that the neighborhood, the marginal neighborhood, the, mi the migrant neighborhood can become a political unit in its own terms. And this has been the premise, again, of the work. The design of a micro-political system with Casa Familiar in San Isidro in the last 10 years, and it has taken us, in fact, 12 years to pr produce the changes in zoning and the aligning of financial frameworks to build this project in the next two years. Casa Familiar, a non-profit organization grounded in this environment, uh, becoming a mediating agency that has uh, begun to map, that has been mapping the stealth urbanism, urbanization in this neighborhood. In other words, rendering the tangible concreteness of these uh, uh, alterations and these parcels so that the municipality of San Diego could enable and overlay housing, uh, affordable housing zone. Uh, the enacting and the production of new workshops with the community. This is a story, part of the story that I wish I could actually just, this could be a whole uh, conversation with you because I've been interested in the construction of communicational systems, uh, urban pedagogical models that can transcend the equally uh, patronizing community-based practices that, that really uh, have not ad enabled the advancement of our debate. In other words, we need to produce a new critical interface with communities to transcend the kind of uh, cliches, I, ha I hope, and the kind of hijacking of the debate out of the packaging of identity uh, through style and form-based code. Uh, so the production of uh, games uh, that really, and devices and visualizations that enable the question of density, uh, what makes, uh, what is uh, subsidies, what is really mixed use and so on. Uh, a new type of interface would necessitate the design again of pedagogical systems. Um, uh, and of course, the uh, collaboration uh, with the municipality of San Diego in its, in its very strange transformation in the last years uh, enables, again, a kind of partnership that is essential, of course, but how this nonprofit organization is given the power to facilitate construction permits uh, for many of these uh, illegal parcels uh, by enacting a kind of social contractual uh, uh, process. In other words, the nonprofit organization calls upon the people who own these parcels to partner in order to make these residents co-developers uh, of their own housing, locking into place a kind of, again, social contract that would prevent gentrification. I think this is a, a topic that is, has been incredibly critical in our debate in this particular case study. Gentrification, of course, happens uh, when people are displaced because of the increased real estate values, even though I would say provocatively that I, I'm not afraid of gentrification. Any marginal neighborhood needs to improve. But the problem is in the task and the challenge is how uh, the people who live in this neighborhood uh, co-manage and co-benefit co from those uh, uh, profits. Uh, so the, the social contrast that would enable a very different idea of uh, development. In other words, instead of giving the large subsidies to private developers to build this 50 unit uh, uh, building, can that 50 unit uh, uh, subsidy based loan be fragmented into 50 smaller pieces as a nonprofit organization might take the liability in fact in negotiating them in the, with, uh, in the partnership uh, with these uh, property owners. So I'm just talking about a process by which we begin to propose very specific uh, procedures, prepackaging, uh, zoning, uh, uh, financial uh, and social organizational models designing new social contracts, another area that has been essential. In other words, the, the, the interface has to be carefully curated, right, in order to enable this, uh, uh, to produce new forms of governance. And finally, uh, how this arrives uh, to the notion of the parcel, the micro-parcel, as a, a, as a small socioeconomic system, just like the Buddhist temple. Uh, so the primary project that has been, the case study has been, uh, the bundling of small parcels uh, in San Isidro uh, 
as this nonprofit organization has begun to acquire small parcels in this neighborhood, and we've been working with others across the United States, uh, in the possibility of rethinking the nature or the role of small-scale development. Again, uh, I'm, by the way, I think I'm doing okay with time, even though you're already falling asleep, but uh, the, the, I wish I could really talk about this further. Uh, this really, uh, somehow, without sounding pretentious, would hit the nail on the head, as you say, uh, in a sense is, that we cannot forget that many of the neighborhoods built uh, in, the, in, the, in the 30s, uh, again, supported by the New Deal uh, and uh, the moment in this, the history of this country where we were not afraid of the public, that many of the projects were neighborhood-based. They were duplexes, fourplexes, and even in Los Angeles, uh, sixplexes, or the six-packs as they are called. At some point in the history of this country, the financial and zoning institutions collaborating and supporting the small guy, they say, call it this way. I hate to, call, to, 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 to reveal uh, uh, my belief of the American dream, but if we are going to talk about it, this really relocated from the large to the small. In other words, uh, how to recuperate the possibility of small-scale development, small parts, that can ultimately be uh, financially a lot more responsible at the scale of uh, these communities. So a church that is transforming to an incubator, I believe very much in this idea of incubating others, and the idea that Casa Familiar had of producing a space where we would conceptualize with artists and architects very specific socioeconomic programming that can be plugged into these spaces. Uh, very simple rooms uh, charged with electricity and collective kitchens that flanked many of these uh, circulation systems from alleys to streets that can be then threaded with housing configurations that are addressing different socioeconomic demographics, such as this typology that is uh, primarily catering to single mothers with children, who in turn are asked uh, to participate in the co-managing of the programming, uh, the programming that is inserted into these uh, social rooms, a duplex given to a, a couple of social uh, practice artists who exchange rent for social service, uh, and that in turn also collaborate in the production of pedagogical models to enable more operational participation from the community, less symbolic. Uh, a series of large units for uh, families with grandmothers who share kitchens and who in turn partner with non -profit organ their non-profit organization with Casa Familiar to use this small infrastructure of social service. And finally, a small uh, series of uh, sheds that are called accessory buildings uh, that by code, uh, if they are no larger than 120 square feet, they can be built without a permit. That's a 10 by 12 room, if we give it a 15-foot ceiling heights with a utility sink and a big window can become a wonderful painting studio or a room for an extended family, but this can be built by the community. The interesting thing is that in a small parcel, we can prove that we can enable the coexistence of different housing economies, but the spaces in between are curated carefully by very smart, I hope, socioeconomic programming. And it is that curatorial aspect of uh, the kind of cultural management and the social and economic uh, devices uh, that really makes this project uh, different. So obviously, it's a very uh, simple and clear uh, message that in conditions of marginality and poverty, housing cannot survive on its own. It needs to be plugged with support systems. Uh, let me finish now uh, with the idea that while I've been really co uh, uh, concentrating the work on the scale of, of the small scale, uh, by amplifying the role of these neighborhoods as uh, laboratories to rethink governance uh, and so on. I'm interested, of course, in the kind of trickling up of the micro into the macro to understand the performance of these neighborhoods as also mirroring the performance of the larger territory. Can we, in fact, go from the border neighborhood to the reimagination of the border region? Can we, in fact, uh, think of how these two neighborhoods, which again, all the images that I showed you in this uh, presentation come from these two neighborhoods, San Isidro to the north, Laureles Canyon to the south. You can see the faint borderline there. But can we begin to propose, which has been spoken about uh, but never really uh, uh, functionally enabled, an urbanization made of neighborhoods or a kind of uh, enabling of these uh, logics that are very specific to really begin to touch the abstraction of urban policy, which is really what has bothered me in the last years. Again, the challenge of how do we move from the abstraction of urban uh, policy to the specificity of the conditions of crisis as inscribed in these border neighborhoods. 
marginal neighborhoods are sites of production, and it cannot be any more evidence that in the recent years, when all the architectural intelligentsia of the world probably flocked in mass to Dubai and China to decorate those uh, uh, recipes of economic power, what idea, and I would like to ask you, maybe you can help me to uh, change my mind, but what idea was advanced in many of these environments of economic power that could fundamentally reorganize and re uh, uh, reimagine uh, the way the, the city is constructed? It was in fact in marginal neighborhoods across the world where out of conditions of socioeconomic emergency, they remain in fact sites of cultural production and socioeconomic production. It was in these environments where there were agencies, uh, uh, non-profit and beyond at the smaller scales, but also in terms of top-down governments as in Latin America, interested in the curating of the interface between the top-down and the bottom-up. Because even though it might seem that some of us, again, working with the informal might be cataloged as a kind of bottom-up whatever, I think that the project that is still challenging to all of us is in fact how do we negotiate and calibrate the relationship between the top-down and the bottom-up, uh, reconnecting urban policy with the urgency of public participation in our time. Let me finish because I know that this is in the context not only of Mexico, New Mexico, but I think at a grander, uh, uh, more, uh, broader scale, it's about the reconfiguration, the political reconfiguration of Latin America in our time in the last uh, uh, couple of decades. I think that there is no other place in the world where in fact top-down governments at municipal levels were reconstructing the political itself. The problem is not architectural to begin with. It's a political project that would re, 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 engage uh, ideas of socioeconomic inclusion and of public participation to, re, uh, to, to construct what I called earlier a civic imagination, what drove many of these experiments. From the late 70s probably, when in Porto Alegre, the, uh, Brazil, uh, the mayor decides to enact these participatory budgets while later becoming problematic in its own terms, served as devices that can really, that began to mobilize other opportunities beyond. But imagine that, communities having a say in the redistribution of municipal budgets to, of course, what all, we all, all know about in terms of the experiments at Curitiba, and somebody sent me an email recently, oh, the Curitiba did not work, and we tend to uh, forget and not edit. We, we need to really be urban editors in this case to extract some of the most compelling lessons in this bottom-up type of infrastructure that negotiated, again, top-down industry and uh, social activism. Uh, of course, with the fantastic works in Bogota out of the reconfiguration of the constitution itself uh, of a country that was seeking to reconnect social justice and urbanization and the investment in education at federal and municipal levels to enact a civic participatory project that then paved the way, uh, again, in the hands of Antanas Mocus, that paved the way to Enrique Peñalosa's uh, famous uh, transportation system, but very seldom we talk about the relationship, not only of those two conditions, but also the journey from the 70s as this knowledge from Porto Alegre mutated into Curitiba and then later translated itself and was enacted in Bogota, all the way to the one, probably one of the most compelling cases, as we all know, in terms of Medellin, I wanted to close with this a kind of other cross-section, because probably what we need know about Medellin is the protagonism of its buildings, but we never really talk about the complexity of the institutional processes that made that project happen. And that has been part of my research in the last years. In fact, I'm going to Medellin again in October because I'm producing a visualization, a large map that really talks about and can really be, uh, can reflect on the fundamental restructuring of the political system as the government began to negotiate again a very compelling relationship uh, uh, between top-down and bottom-up. Uh, what makes these projects incredibly amazing is that these are the only places in the world where governments said, we are going to invest all our resources in the marginal zones. We're going to stop for a moment uh, investing here. We're going to shift our gaze. And they were the only ones that began to tap into social networks and informal economies as devices to rethink urbanization. 
So again, in my journeys to Medellin, and many, very time, many times we just look up to the library, but here is where I began in the edges of the city, in this uh, protected environmental zone, uh, which is this huge park next to the city where the cable car ends. And as we begin to descend into the huge ravine that is Medellin, we begin to come from the edges, from the marginal zones of the city into the center, and we begin to, again, see where those library parks and the, uh, that, that infrastructure is located. Again, an incredible uh, process, not only of restructuring uh, these informal environments, but a huge investment uh, in infrastructure of mobility, but ultimately in the redistribution of resources. Uh, so here's where the cable car uh, is. You walk down and probably you find a donkey waiting to uh, move material up the hill, uh, and maybe what we never talk about, but beneath this transportation system, there is an agency that, cap uh, that enables the, 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 the support of informal economies by, again, uh, opening up very different structures of funding. In other words, the decentralization of the banking industry touching these environments uh, of marginality, the physicalization of the negotiation between the private and the public and the public realm, uh, the opening up of the, of the school system. I mean, there are many, uh, of course, physical ideas, that, uh, uh, physicalization of these ideas that is compelling. But uh, let me close uh, again by suggesting, and by the way, look at this, the library. We never look, f uh, we look at the library, but we never look at the adjacencies uh, uh, and how we begin to descend into uh, how these uh, projects began to reorganize the, water the watershed system as a device to uh, rethink density, uh, linking these neighborhoods that were divided by small uh, acupuncture or uh, uh, acupuncture infrastructure. Um, in essence, when we finish uh, descending into the city that takes less than uh, uh, 15 minutes, we arrive to the metro that takes us immediately to the center of the city. This linkage between that, again, enclave of wealth and the sectors of marginality is an incredible uh, lesson uh, uh, to witness. Uh, but in essence, uh, and, and again, this would necessitate even another uh, uh, presentation, but let me finish with four uh, thoughts. Medellin is important, not in Latin America in this context, uh, not only because it became, again, uh, the, the sector, uh, uh, the global sector, that really began to enact a very different idea of growth and of urbanization. A series of concepts fundamental that needs to be opened up. The office of Sergio Fajardo, in this case, enabling the centralization and decentralization uh, uh, conditions simultaneously. By that I mean, summoning all the fragmented political powers into the office of the mayor to unify a kind of vision uh, that is integrative, but only with the skills to decentralize the resources that were before centralized and benefiting just a few. This project of simultaneous centralization and decentralization is incredible to witness. The other one is to enable the convergence of top-down economic resources, bottom-up social relations, in natural boundaries, as we begin to notice again, uh, this is almost as in, in a way of summary, how in these uh, topographic conditions, uh, the convergence uh, of the contour line of the bottom up against social organization in the top down injection of resources begins to construct a different idea uh, of development. In the careful curating and designing of socioeconomic inclusion, in other words, for each building that probably you have witnessed uh, in the past about Medellin, there is a series of institutions, agencies, uh, uh, top down and bottom up, uh, linking government with social activism that are behind the designing of uh, cultural programming and agency. In other words, it's not just designing buildings, it's also designing uh, the sustainable cultural and social and economic programming that would make those buildings live in the long term. I'm saying this because obviously students, you know, they teach us in the School of Architecture to design nice buildings, but never, they never teach us who is going to take care of them in the long term. The careful designing of the relationship of space and again, a, a, a cultural programming is, is, is fundamental in the democratization of urban development. And to end again, probably catapulting from the border, uh, the global border to the border neighborhood to Latin America back to maybe another uh, scale, which is, of course, more conceptual. This would uh, define a, an incredible challenge to all of us. How do we reconceive 
utopia. Of course, this is obvious in, a, in the recent shift in, in, in the globe at this moment. Uh, how do we uh, reorganize our epistemological, pedagogical systems, our practices, to engage again other modes of political and public participation? Uh, of course, it reflects on the words of Shishek when he reminds us, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world out of a climatic cataclysm than a modest alterations of capitalism. In other words, the point is uh, the rethinking of utopia would only be in the hands of again being infected and affected by a sense of urgency in our time. I mean, we continue to talk about how the crisis might enable the rethinking and the reorganization of our protocols, but it's a promise yet to be fulfilled. The reformations of the institutions uh, is essential, and only a sense of urgency can ultimately be uh, enabled by a new civic imagination, really what is at stake today. Thank you very much. <laughs>